Professor Lebrou, in my humble opinion, is a singular genius. His four-volume book, International Dictionary of Musicians of Color, from antiquity to the end of the 19th century, is a magnificent achievement. In Latin, we would call it his magnum opus, his great work. The reason for writing the book was, I didn't know about these people at first. And then I realized there was a vacuum, an empty space in our knowledge of black musicians. The material that I tried to amass in my book has been around, but not codified. And in my studies of uh, music, a lot of this information was hidden. So it was a matter of finding <clears throat> things that related to the black experience, especially in America and elsewhere, that um, showed that we were a part of communities where there were only whites. We were part of communities even in China, although China says they didn't have any blacks. We found out that they did have blacks there. And wherever blacks had congregated, there was had to be music. We're musical people. Sensing that there was this diversity, as I went from college in Oldland, Ohio, to New York, I found there were hundreds of black musicians out there doing things. And nobody knew anything about them, except the, uh, the big ones, you know, Lena Horne and Duke Ellington. That's all we knew about. We didn't know about the lesser lights, especially in smaller cities. Initially, I had to find a way of finding out who was who, so I used the United States censuses going back to 1790. And I covered as many states as I could that listed, so Mr. John Doe, musician, black, or colored, or mulatto. And I said, oh, this is a whole new bunch of people. And so I started making lists. And after making all of these lists, I found out it's too much for one book. You have to, you have to uh, increase it to the size that uh, uh, is worthy of looking at. And so it turned into this international dictionary because a lot of the people from other countries were coming over to the United States trying to get into the music business. And uh, we weren't counting them as uh, musicians because they were from foreign countries. And I said, well, they had something to do with the development of music in our area, so put them in. Professor LeBrew's four-volume work, which approaches 3,000 pages and tens of thousands of names never before recorded. Since 1969 to the present. I don't know, I can't add all the years up at the moment. 69, 79, 89, 99, 109, 40 years, 50 years of amassing, well, I should say, of amassing the material. Wherever I visited, whatever cities I was in, I would visit the local museums, the local libraries, the historical societies. And I've been to many, many cities. I remember being in Columbus, Ohio at a Negro convention, and I took off and went to the library. And I said, do you have anything about the, best, the famous blacks that used to live in Columbus? And the assistant said, we did something on that years ago, but nobody's used it. And he pulled out a whole folder where the librarians had amassed the contributions of the blacks in their efforts in Columbus, Ohio. Treasure trove, you know what I mean? I had read the black newspapers. The earliest black newspaper, one I think was the Freedom's Journal of 1828 and it mentioned affairs that we were having where the musicians had to play and perform, and I jotted it down. And then I went to the Liberator, 
which was a long lasting paper. And I looked through and on the advertisement, you see we're having a concert here and a concert there and they were covering the whole country. They would even cover Detroit. And they would say Detroit in 1839 is having the, their first emancipation program and they would name the names of the Detroit people. They were getting all this information in. And so going through the Liberator, I picked up a hell of a lot of stuff from all over the country. There was an iconographer in Philadelphia who had a wealth of material in his big, large archive. Um, and um, when I went there, he had so much stuff that he Every time I would go to Philadelphia, I had to live at his house. So I've learned to ask people, especially those who don't have children, like uh, Dr. Charlton, who was one of the best organists in New York City. He had no children. And when I went to visit him in his 90s, he said, take all this stuff, LeBru. He says, and write me up, but leave me one footprint in the sands of time. I said, the man is a great man and he only wants one footprint? He ought to have three or four or five. You see what I mean? So we, I've had to watch out and find people who don't have relatives who are sensitive to what they're doing and say, bring the material somewhere. Let somebody have that material so they can write it up correctly. In my writings, what I'd like to leave is a trail that other people can follow easily. Um, and improve themselves in future ventures. It's still not finished because there's a lot I could not do. I could not research every single place in the world. Other people will have to do that later. So our mind is just the beginning.